I'm alive, Clive. <laughs> How do? How do I? Not got your seatbelt on this time, have you? No, I've not got my seatbelt on this good time. Bye, good bye. So this is Kira. Um, before we start, she is super nervous. I've said this before, right? She's putting a story out there now. She has family. She is a mum. Got friends. Well, maybe one or two. Um, so it is a big thing for people. She's been building up for months. Yeah. And you've decided this is finally the time. Yeah. So we're going to take it steady. We're going to pretend nobody's there. And uh, we're just going to have a little chat. Yeah. So childhood then. Young lady. Do you want to sit back and relax? <laughs> Go on, childhood. Yeah, so um, pretty normal childhood. Yeah, brother. pretty normal childhood. And then um, your brother. Yeah, my brother, I think he was nine or eight. He got, I was about 13, he got diagnosed with logic. Hodgkinson's lymphoma. Yeah, and he had a tumour in his throat. I come home from school, it was ambulances, how, everything how had just changed. How old were you changed. then? Um, I was only 13, so it's not many years between me, three and a half years between my little brother. And I think that's when things obviously changed in our family, because there's four kids. Yeah. So with my mum and dad trying to split the time staying in hospital with him and then trying to deal with us, and obviously my yeah. dad's still working. It's pretty hard. Yeah, it's definitely hard work. Mm -hmm. And is that the first thing in your life that had been sort of... Yeah. Traumatic yeah, up to them? Yeah, first thing. First thing, we're just pretty normal family. And then obviously that happened, so it tested us, didn't it? So, do you want to fast forward to 15? Yeah. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, obviously, I don't know how these things come about. I know a little bit, so just in your own time... Um, so 15, I went off the rails in school. Obviously, I've got bipolar. I always knew there was something different with me. I couldn't take orders in school. I was bullied in school, but they were just di didn't listen to me. I were was, you different? Me, I was very different. So then school didn't want me in full time. They only wanted me in from nine till 11. Give up to the point where I don't want to go to school. I don't want to listen to anyone. And I had a friend, she lived in Moss Side. And we used to knock about down there and 15, I'm just at the bus stop and I meet this guy called Mac. Older guy, I thought he was only about 21, that's what he told me. Turns out he was 39. Yeah. He knew my age, I never lied about it, so yep. I was 15. It was actually in school uniform that day. Um, got talking, exchanged numbers. I remember I got bullied in school. I want one of the pretty girls, I want, you know, one of the popular girls. So it felt nice, do you know what I mean? Started talking to him, he had his own flat, going around his own flat. Within a matter of weeks, I was absolutely brainwashed. Two weeks in, started smacking me about. Do I know it's not normal? Maybe. But I'm that brainwashed, I've got no friends. No, I'm struggling at home because like, my mum and my dad know I'm different. I was saying, oh, I'm staying at my mates, but I'm not, I'm staying at his. And then it come about, why right, my dad knew, um, I don't know if you can say it that, he busted my lip open. You're nervous, bless <laughs> yeah. you. You're all right. <laughs> he busted my lip open, um, so I went to the hospital and I'd said to the hospital, oh, can you phone my parents and say, like, I fell on my face? Nothing's not allowed to lie. So then it carried on, my dad had ground me, I'd run out, I'd go and meet him, got to the point where I hit 16, you can't do nothing. I can live where I want to live. So I moved in with him. The guy was an absolute animal. I didn't know at the time that he was brassing girls out, young girls from care homes. And he used to just batter me all the time to the point I was a black eyes. Remember, I'm only 16. And then like, police getting called all the time. They're bringing me home. And then it comes to a head. Um, I started going to college, like I told you, I was training to be an aerostat. But in order to be an aerostat, it's all about image. So if I'm going into college and I've got a black eye, they're saying, right, we can't have you on the course, we don't know what's going on in your personal life. I'm walking from Hume to Stockport every single day to try and go to that? college. It's miles away. Is it? It's miles away. 
It's on the other side of Manchester. Really? Yeah. Well, how long did it take you? An hour, an hour and a half. To walk to college? Yeah, to walk to college and then walk home. Proper old school, that. Yeah, because, as I said, I didn't have no money, like, didn't can, have a job. Can I just ask you, right, so... Manic depressive bipolar. We said this before. I mean, manic depressive is He's a better the best description. Word for it, yeah. So, very little help as kids. Yeah. People don't like to give you a diagnosis. They don't like to medicate kids. Nope. Um, it's it's basically the kids. Yeah. So there's the nothing hormones, for them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm going to use the word normal. If you'd have been normal, do you think that would have not happened? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. People who are bipolar... Make rash decisions. Make don't, rash decisions. Um, don't really think like your normal person. No. If, if thought patterns are very different. Be <sighs> people always say... I, I, I don't know. People always say, well, you know, the, the first time someone touched me, I'd be out of there. I've always said it. Always said it. Or hitting back. Like, I'm not scared of anyone. But until you're in that moment... That, it's not just a physical bit. Listen, I can go through a physical pain. I've been through enough of it in my life. We as humans are built for it. Otherwise, you know, you won't get in a boxing ring. But it's Correct. the mental abuse. When they strip you of every piece of your identity to the point where you feel like that's the only person that does love you in the world, the only person that does care for you in the world. And that's what breaks you down to, in order to stay with them because you think, well, you've got nothing now. I've let everyone down. No, I've embarrassed myself, so stay, just ride it out, you'll get better. So, if if you've had a beating, yeah, mm -hmm. how long after that would you sort of, of forgive him? If you're not, how long? Straight away. Straight away. All right, I'll give you an example. So one day, I got a job in a call centre. He didn't like it. He'd rather me have been a prostitute. He told me enough times. Well, I've got this job and I've come out, well, back to his flat and I'm buzzing about it. Next thing, I've woke up on the floor. Bang, clean out. I've woke up to him stamping on my stomach. I'm screaming. He's up. Then he's dragged me outside and he's holding me by my leg over the balcony. Like we're two floors up. So a neighbour comes out and helps me, walks me to the hospital. The minute I get in that hospital, I said to the nurse, can I phone my boyfriend? Because to me, he's my boyfriend. So she's gone, yeah. I phoned him and gone, I'm really sorry. I won't make you mad again. I couldn't even open my eyes. I've got a timber and footprint. I didn't know the nurse had overheard me. So he said, right, it's all right. I'll come to the hospital. So when I've discharged myself to come out of the hospital, the hospital was surrounded by the police. Really? But I'm like, he's not done anything wrong. Just leave him alone. They've arrested him. Because he also stabbed me in my leg there with a piece of glass. So they've arrested him and brought me back in the hospital. And then they've, like, got social services involved. They tried to put me in this, like, B&B &B thing. And in while he was stabbing me, he's cut the tendons off his finger. So they've had to take him to Withenshaw Hospital. So we're not in Plastic the same surgery hospital. hospital. Yeah. I get the tax out all the way up there to see if he was okay. The police have cut, and I've given him a card to where the B&B &B was. So the police said, you can't do that now, you've compromised yourself, go back to the B&B. &B. So as I've gone back, they've gone, your mum's been here. I thought, no, <laughs> no, I'm off. So he had a guy living with him that dealt drugs. But he used to say to me, because this Mark was a crackhead, he was an animal on crack. And the guy that used to sell it from the house, obviously he used to give him bits, he used to say to me, don't touch this, like, you need to leave him. Well, I knew where the house was he was dealing drugs, so I've gone down, got the keys, and he's gone, what's happened to you? I went, oh, I got jumped by loads of girls. And he's looking at me, I goes back to the flat, and I'm laying in bed and hear the door open. And he, they, they bailed him, don't ask why they bailed him. So I've gone, I'm sorry, and he was like, no, it's all right, we'll make it better, because just... Be the day before we'd found out I was pregnant so like obviously I said like oh I've had a miscarriage oh, it's stamped on my stomach he goes it's all right we can try again so I'm like oh he's gonna look after me now like didn't touch me for a few days and it happened it's getting to the point where I literally I couldn't see a way out I don't want to go home with my tail between my legs with my mum and dad they've tried to drag me on 
the, the police Were they told still, him, your mum yeah, and dad, but, obviously you the daughter, so... Yeah, of course. And my dad always, he gave me a pound and he said, if you ever need me, I'll put it in the phone box. And no matter what, he took everything off me. Anything that I had, a phone, like he cut my hair off, like anything that I had, like he'd take it. And it comes to a head one day, it absolutely smashed me to smithereens everywhere, the flat. And I just, I walked out in just a t-shirt, nothing on my feet. And I remember running to the phone box and my dad saying, come home. And I've gone home and he'd gone back to answer to bail and they remanded him to strange ways. But I couldn't live at home. I'd been out too long on my own. Like... When things like that happen, you're never the same person. Like, my heart had gone, like, dark. I'd gone older in my ways. So we're still running away. And I didn't know that they'd bailed him to his baby mum's in Liverpool until he phoned me one night and said, like, I'm back. I'm going back and forth, back and forth. I'm still getting hit. And what broke the camel's back is New Year's Eve 2006. He literally, like, was saying to me, oh, I'm going to put you on the game. He was trying to make me smoke drugs. I was having none of it. So he's got pissed because he was pissed. And he's dragged me down, downtown. As I'm stood there, because all the working girls used to look after me. You know, they was lovely. They'd give me a bit of money or give me some food. This is how I met Marvin. So I'm stood there and I see this guy on the bike. So I'm trying not to look. So he comes over and he's like on to one of the working girls because he knows him. And he's gone, who are you? So I've gone, mind your business. So he's gone, don't tell me you're with him. And Mark stood there and I'm thinking, you're going to get me battered. So he's like, he's a fucking ponce. He's this, that and the other. And he went, pass me. So Mark's gone in the shop and he's gone, pass me your phone. He's put his number in. He went, don't want nothing off you. I'm not like that. He went, but I'll get you away from him. Like, I'll be your friend. So I'm thinking, yeah, all right, so off the goals. Did you, did you like the look of him? Marv. You know what? There was something different about him. Because to me, Mark was the scariest person in the world. So for him to come over, I'm thinking, who's this guy? Like, what's this guy all about? And I remember him saying to me just as he drove off, I'm mad at you one day. And I went to him, ew, fuck off. <laughs> like, who even says that to, you know, random person? Listen, uh, you know... Uh... So I'm 16, he said to me, how old are you? I go to 18. I know he's a bit older. If I say I'm 16, is he really going to want to be my friend? So off he goes. And I knew he was a drug addict at the time, Marvin. But to me, I'd been around that scene. So to me, it was like, oh, everyone must do it. Everyone must smoke crack. Can I, I, I just ask you a quick one now. I don't want him to interrupt yeah, you. I'm enjoying on. this. So people get upset when they get crackhead. So you can say addict, can't you? Yeah. However, a crackhead is a person who behaves in a certain way mm -hmm. and literally that's all they live for. Yeah, of course. Live and die for, innit? That's all Nothing else. Style the name for it. When you, when you were... See, with Marvin, I, I've i never put him in the same category because he's got heart. Like, he's no matter through his drug addiction, he always put me first when it comes to my emotions. Marvin is obviously a part <laughs> <laughs> just just like let's just, just clarify that yeah. yeah so he was always different even though i knew what he was about so there was just something about him i can't explain it like he was loving and he was caring he wasn't your average thief like he wouldn't attack people he wouldn't burgle people don't get me wrong going out shoplifting it's you know it's it's still a crime of course but compared to like what people like like you see so people are robbing a woman on the street and yeah, not think twice were. about it and go and give the drug dealer the money well he's, he didn't like he'd do crimes that you could say didn't they didn't affect people but like maybe they affected companies and whatever yeah so we knew there was something different about him so off we go when we go into the gay village because he wants to get pissed and he starts battering me in this club for no reason everyone's around no one's helping at that time, my phone rang, so I'm trying to run off. So he's gone, where are you? Are you safe? This is Marvin. So I've gone, no, he's lathering me. So, because he was on his bike, he goes, get on my bike, I'll give you the back here. And he takes me, you know, 
Come on. Is this a motorbike? <laughs> yeah, of course it is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a bicycle. So, like, I goes to meet up with him. That's quite romantic, really. Yeah, give me a vacuum. You, you know, right. imagine you were a cowboy and jump on his horse or something. <laughs> um, and then he had to obviously go home because he was on curfew. He'd just got out of license. I think he'd just got out after two and a half years. So he wanted to spill his life story to me even then. You know, I'm having a cat. Keep quiet. No, definitely not. And then I went back to the flat to Mark. What happened to that that night, I won't go into because no. there's only certain people that know that. No, you, you, listen, you know, it's what you're comfortable with. Some of this already, obviously, you thought a lot about this, so no, that's mm. fine. And then he forced me to go to Liverpool the next day. Obviously, I'm black and blue again. My dad's phoning me because this is New Year's Day. Yeah. So I told him in the coach station, look, he's holding me against me, Will. And I said to me, I can't do it no more. And I think it was more because I met Marv. And Did you have like a glimmer of hope? Yeah, yeah. But then he used to ring me and I'd say, yeah, I'll meet you. I used to make him go there and then not turn up to test him. Did you? Yeah, I'd switch my phone off and then listen to his voice. <laughs> and then it changed. Like we met one night and we went for food. And, you know, he was living with his niece at the time that became my best friend. And if... You know, everything was good. And then my mum found out. I had Were you out then? Had you split from this guy? Yeah. Was he still pursuing you? Yeah, of course, till this day. Really? Till this day. Still? Still. Still. So, my mum, I goes home and my mum finds out I've got a boyfriend. 100%. She doesn't believe me. That's fine. You can choose him and you can get out. I just thought, you know what? It's going too far. You're trying to. I'm 16, but you're trying to control me. Like, to me, I'm a grown woman. So I was going to go and stay at my friend's, and he said, oh, no, come and stay with me at my niece's. Rash decision. So I've gone, all right, then. I will do. And I felt safe. Like, I was still speaking to my parents. My mum rang me and said, come home. And I was like, no, just give me bro my brother my bedroom. And if, that is what literally saved me. Did, did you go and live there? Yeah, I went and lived there. did you there. feel comfortable? Yeah. Straight his, away? Yeah, his niece had two kids under the age of two. She made me feel, like, really welcome there. It's making me quite emotional, though. <laughs> Don't you start you know, mate. <laughs> no, I'm not, but it's like, it's, it is hard to listen to, you know. I didn't know all this. Obviously, I know you pretty well now, but I didn't know all this. Fucking hell. Anyway, go on. So I went to live there and then say I'd be in town on my own. I'd always bump into me. It was like he was stalking me. So I was like, you need to leave me alone. And he was like, oh, you think you've got back up now because of Marvin? Because I didn't know they'd been in jail together. Had they? Yeah. So Marvin knew what he was about. And uh, how did Marvin feel about this? Absolutely. Knowing, well, knowing the guy. Um... Absolutely. That's what he says to me to this day. I have to get you away from him. Even if you didn't want a relationship with me. See, we've become friends. Do you know what I mean? It wasn't... Yeah. We've become friends and then... Obviously, he was on licence, he was a drug addict. Yeah, and you and knew he, that. Yeah, then he goes missing. He's on his toes. The police are coming through, his niece says. So I'm thinking, oh my God, like, what's going to happen? She says, no, you can stay here. Really? Like, you can stay here with me and the kids. So oh, I was yeah. like, are you sure? She was like, yeah. So about a week later, she phones me and my sisters and she goes, my uncle's just rang. I went, oh, what's her? She said, yeah, can you get back to my knife? Now we're just going to ring you. So Marvin's got, oh, still has, but back then he had a really big reputation. Like she's never seen anyone speak down to her uncle. So she goes, out oh, strange way. So I said, pass me the phone. So he's gone, hiya, babe, thinking it's her. And I went, don't hiya, babe, me, you little bastard. <laughs> so we started laughing. He went, oh, will you come and visit, ma? So I went, yeah, I am. I'm going to slap you on, and then I never want to see you again. So you go on the visit. He says this, he says that. And then I don't see him for nine months. He got shipped to Rizla. There was, there was um, an error with his paperwork and they kept him six months longer than he should have. And then it comes to a head. I was living with his niece and I could, like, a boyfriend was there. And you know when you start feeling uncomfortable? Uncomfortable, yeah. So I got in with this gang like a big gang and um, they taught me how to do fraud and how to shoplift and I was good at it. 
and I was making hundreds a day. So I thought, right, I'm gonna go. So at the time, I'm still working with the police through this court case. So he says, we'll put you in Women's Direct Access. That's fine. What's that? It's a hostel for women. Okay. And you're in there and there's a lot of drug addicts and working girls and that. To me, it's probably like jail, but they all looked after me. Did I'm you just, feel comfortable there? Yeah, I felt really comfortable. They all looked after Did me. Did they look after each other? Yeah, they look after each other. You know the working girls, because the cars were outside and stuff. And then one night, this new woman come and she's trying to inject everyone outside my door. So it ended up in some massive fight. The police separated us, brought me home and found me another hostel. This hostel was like a kid's home. You've got to do other people's chores. You've got to do this, you've got to do that. Absolutely not. I'm making money, but I'm also getting arrested. Like, this has never happened to me in my life. I'm going to my mum's and dropping money on the counter. I'm off my head because they introduced me to sniff cocaine. Me, me acting like what I'd be grown up, I've just gone along with it. How did this go with the old bipolar thing? I think it? that's why I made the decisions that, you know, I made. It was only a chance encounter that I met, bumped into this girl in town and she's gone, will you take this back to the shop for me? So I've gone, yeah. And then they've gone, yeah, do you want to come out with us? And then she got locked up and she was the only girl was on the team. Was it a shoplifting team. gang? There was a fraud gang, like, they had right. their own men that worked in the post office. The were, like, so we'd get the cards direct to us, bank cards. They had people that worked in the bank, so if you rang up with the security... These was not amateurs, these was professional people. Like I could take 10 grand on a card in one day and then it's split between. So say you sell it for half price, then it's split in between the four of us. But I'm out every day, I'm out at night, I'm just, you know, it's coming on top. So when I couldn't live in that hostel, I said to my mum, I'm now 17, I'm gonna you know, I've applied for my own flat, I'm gonna come home, so. Were you drinking and that? Yeah. But partying and stuff? Yeah. Like, if we went out and did a graph, then we're in a club. Like, I couldn't tell you what I was spending my money on. It was going through my hands like water. Don't forget, I've, like, I'm just like a kid. I've never had that. I grew up where my mum was a stay-at-home mum and my dad worked from sun up till sundown. We was never poor, but we was never rich. We, was, we lived from paycheck to paycheck. Yeah. And I've seen my mum and my dad struggle, like, I've seen them have loan sharks at the door, you know, to feed us, yeah. stuff like that. So I'm going home and I'm leaving money in the car. And my mum's thinking, like, don't don't ask her anything, like, she'll fly off the handle and we won't see her again. So I moved in with my mum and my dad and then the police come. Uh, oh, no, no, I tell her, I, I did this graft. We'd already got five grand on this card, and I said to him, he's a being greeter. I do know I'll go into that supermarket. Oh, just one more, one more. I got caught. 36 hours, I sat in a police station. I had all this woman's documents on me, bank cards on me, and I was up in youth court, and they was just like, this, for your age, is absolutely ridiculous. Put me on probation. But it still carried on, it still carried on. And then I kind of just cut them off. Like, when I was going through the court case with Mark, I kind of just was doing my own thing. I fell out with the girl because she got like, oh, you think you're better than me? No kind of thing. And it was turning into, like, these are big people. I don't want to be around them. And then I did the court case with Mark. I'd applied, like, for my own property. And we went to court. Was, was he up? What charges was he on? He was up for numerous charges. So. Was it against you? All against me. So, like, GBH, um, sexual assault, sex with a minor. Um, and he was looking at big jail. And that's why I hate defence barristers. So the judge calls me to the chambers, which is very rare, and yep. says, you can run this cha tra charge on the sex charges, but I'm going to tell you now what the defence is saying. You was in a relationship with him. I can have even 15 and be in a relationship with an early 40 year old man. You can run the trial, but it's a case if it's going to collapse and he'll walk with nothing. Or you can do a plea and you get five and a half years. I, well, Marvin was in jail, but he had a mobile. So I said, oh, I need a day to think about it. <laughs> so, text his mobile because I don't know if he's in his pad or he's out. Yeah. Can you phone me? So I've talked it through with him and he's gone, do what you think is best, just don't let him walk. Oh, I took the play and he got five and a half years in jail. 
and that was that. Then I got like my first flat. I was still shoplifting because, like, I got my first flat. How I've old not... are you now? How old am I now? Thirty-one. No. Oh, see, now you've given it away. You did that on purpose. I didn't. I, didn't. I meant <laughs> how old were you then? Seventeen. So that is a when heavy two years. Flat. That that is a lot to happen in two years. Yeah, of course. Have you had any treatment or counselling or all for this bipolar? In them two years? No. Oh, no my mum was taking me to the doctors at like 13, 14. Like, it's, our behaviour's not normal. Like, I could only have this one bubble. And if I didn't have this one I remember one day I couldn't find it. It was OCD. on my wrist. It was on my wrist. I literally just took my barge over part. Like, it wasn't normal, the things that I was doing. And I was telling them, you know, like, it's not normal. But I told you, they blame it on our moms, don't they? Yeah. And they say, oh, it's, you know, it's because you're a teenager. Well, gets me on flat at 17, Marvin's still in jail. And it's a big thing, like, you've got your own flat. This is what I'm, like, oh, this is what you wanted. It's hard. You've got to pay bills. Why right? I'm on JSA and they're giving me £33 a fortnight to live off. Am I paying my bills? So I carried on shoplifting and I carried on doing my thing. And then Marv gets out of jail. He got shipped out from Risley to Buckley Hall, which was great because it was only around the corner from where we lived. I was going to see him and then he got out and like, you know, we started, you know, reconnecting. I told my dad that, you know, I had a boyfriend, he's a bit older than me. Me and my dad had a drink one night on New Year's Eve. Because, uh, no, Christmas Eve, because that was the day Marv got out. And I was like, oh, he's just got out of prison. And my dad was like, all right. He gets pissy, he goes. Didn't say it to my mum. Invite him around for Christmas dinner tomorrow. Really? Yeah. Now, my dad's an Irishman. Don't forget that. He's yeah, a yeah, broad yeah. Irishman. Yeah. Right? So I'm like, oh, yeah, buzzing. So I've gone, oh, Marv, you've been invited. For... He's still not told my mum. He's not told my brothers. So my mum's phoning me. Dinner's late. Did he say he'd go? Yeah, of course he did. Oh, my God. <laughs> so she's like, dinner's late. I went, I'm on my way. So I'm in the door. I've got more brass neck than all my siblings put together. I walked in and went, ta da, he's my new boyfriend. Well, my dad, he nearly died. He dropped the knife and fought. So he's come, hey, Mr. Redmond. Hey, Mrs. Redmond. My dad's gone, who the fuck are you? So I went, it's my new boyfriend. Did you not tell my mum? So my mum's like, get in here now. To your dad? Yeah. So you can hear him. So he pulls out a chair. My dad went, I didn't tell you. You could set well, up my table. Rest it, so they got cushions up <laughs> in behind cushions. That's... My little brother and my big brother were sat there like, oh, what's going Fringe on? Cringe worthy. Cringe like, you've got one. You know, brass, You've got yeah. brass. Wait, he's got brass neck. <laughs> Marvin going in. I can't even imagine going into somebody's house. Meeting the parents and they don't even know. Yeah, you just got out of prison. After being on licence. Yeah, older. Older, yeah, older. And then what's the other thing? What's the other thing? Oh, he's a drug addict. But, no, yeah. the main yeah. thing that pissed my dad off, we're all sitting there and we're all getting on. My dad's a pure United supporter. He's got the badge on his headstone. Right. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Marvin's a city supporter. Everyone round my dinner table's the United supporter. So we're all trying to make a conversation. So he goes, So what football team do you support? I thought, yeah, oh, no. Your dad said that. Yeah. <laughs> so we go set her. Well, that was it. My dad threw his plate and went, Get him out of my fucking Really? House. Yeah. But they didn't. They started talking and, like, he just said, If you hurt my daughter, like, she's been through a lot. And you know, they became best, best friends, my, him and my dad. Honest to God, they were like that. Really? My dad has been dyslexic all his life. Yeah. And just before he died, Marvin taught him how to read him, right? Wow. Yeah. Now, you are going to make me... You know I get emotional <laughs> with things like that. It's your old age, that, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, we know your age. Everyone <laughs> does now, don't we? Yeah, thanks for that. Really? He taught him how to... He taught him how to do his signature. Listen, let me tell you about Marvin, right? Uh, you, you will meet him one day. He's He's... He's got to get his bottle up, yeah. He's not as uh, easy as you. No. But Marvin is prison educated, isn't he? A hundred percent. If you met the guy, you would definitely think university graduate. He's he's so clever. How he speaks, uh, his use of English language and everything else is pretty damn amazing, and it's all prison taught. Isn't it? All street prison taught. That's yeah. what I mean. Then when he gets out of jail, like obviously comes to live with me. He's still on his toes, he's still grafting. How long was it before your dad accepted him then? You know, because that, that would obviously make it a lot easier for you. He went back to jail five days later, Marvin. Oh, oh dear. He broke, so he, he weren't there he broke for his New licence. 
Tell you when he phoned me, so I met him on New Year's Eve. I'm absolutely fuming because we was in, staying in this old cell in town. He's in a bail hostel. Thinks he's really clever. Getting on his toes and walking into the hospital and saying he wasn't well. It's way after his curfew time. Oh, his phone's off, so I'm thinking, I must have gone back to jail. New Year's Day. No New Year's Eve, he phones me. Hiya. I went to him. Where have you been? He went. I can't speak long. I'm in the reception in Strange Ways. I thought, oh my God. So I just put the phone down. I thought, I'll just go away. Don't work like that, like I said. Got, got my own flat. He got out. We started living together. Honest to God. My vid off the police is not the word. The police couldn't stand him. Marvin. But no. No. Because, like, I remember him saying to me one day, your face is on the board tomorrow. Every single morning, your face is on that board. We know that you're out and about all the time, and we will lock you up again. But when he met me, he never did big sentences. He'd do six weeks, eight weeks. He never went into the year sentences like he did before we met me. But honest to God, the police, nuisance calls at like three o'clock in the morning. They'd take my door off. Because he knew that, I knew where he was. Like, like I'd know what, I could have told them that, like, yeah, I go to some houses and you might find him there. But I didn't. And they just constantly raid my house. Like, I remember one Christmas Eve, they ripped all my presents open. Christmas trees knocked on the floor because he was wanted and it just, did you just take that on the chin? Yeah. Don't get me wrong, I'd have a go at him. And I'd say, right, I've had enough of this, like. No, I mean, with the police, like, coming in and behaving like that, did you just let it go? No, I'd give him a mouthful. Because with Marv, I'm not, I always stand up for him. And just say, just, like, leave him alone, like, stop coming round to my house. And this, that and the other. But they wouldn't, it carried on. Right now he's been... Next September, he put 10 years clean, 10 years out of jail. And everyone used to say, he'll be dead by the time he's fought her. Because he was a big crack addict. Like, a lot of people think, oh, I take sniff cocaine. That's, that's not crack. That's not, it is crack. Like, I, it damaged me a lot when I started doing it. Like, obviously, I didn't wake up every day and take cocaine or go out to rob for cocaine. Like, people think it's different. It's an illness, he was poorer. Like, there's some days I won't see him, some weeks I won't see him for five days. Like, I'll give you an example, right? So we so we moved to Gorton from Blakely, because we had to, because Mark got out and told, he, somehow he'd found out where I lived and said he was gonna burn my house down. So the police moved me to this proper end. It was like fireproof letterbox, Really? Yeah, fireproof letterbox. 60 uh, second so response on me address of a phone, the police. Oh, really? Yeah. So we moved and then didn't hear anything. And by this point, Marvin's like really in the crutch of his addiction. Like, he looks a mess. So before we'd left, we decorated, like, because we'd not long lived there. Oh, we loved it. So he's gone for five days. I'm fuming. I come home. He's high as. I don't know what. He's stripping me walls and he's painting me, me doors and me, me new walls. I'm like, what are you doing? I told you I'd decorate for you. You've already decorated. Shit like that was just We're crazy. laughing now, but... At the time, it wasn't fun, eh? Yeah. I don't even know what to say, you know. Um, so how, how did you, how did you put up with this? You know, with his like addiction of him being a crackhead. Do you know what? I'm not even telling a lie. I always knew he'd change. Always. He didn't. No one else believed him. I did. Did I he smoke crack in your house? Never. He's never, ever, ever smoked crack in front of me or in my house. Hence why he used to get off for days. And then he'd come, he come home when he come down and he needed a rest. I'd run him a bath, get him clean clothes, feed him. I'm knowing that in two days later, he's probably going again. Really? Yeah, but he's got heart. So, underneath that being a drug addict, I know how his life started. I know why he thinks he belongs in jail. And to me, he was like a little boy. Like, he saved me, so I wanted to save him. Yep. To show him, look, you know, you will change. And he didn't believe it, and, you know, he carried on doing what he was doing. Like, the police used to come to my house. I'd go to the crack house where he was. I and I've 
Do you know how many prostitutes I've had a fight with, drug dealers that I've had a fight with? Because I've gone, I know he's here. So the police are coming to my house, you're not harboring him. And I'd walk in this drug house and I'd go to him, get out. And they'd Tomorrow. be like, get out. And there'd be big people like, you can't let her speak to you like that. I'd be like, you shut your mouth. Get out. Did he do what you said? Oh, he did what I said. He goes straight home. He'd take that much drugs. He'd want to go to jail to just switch off. Did you not use them in jail? No, no. Didn't use it in jail. Not from what I know he did. So cr cracking like heroin where you... No. See, like, he went to rehab. He lasted a day. Rehab for a crack addict is no good. You can't detox like you can do alcohol. You can't detox like you can do heroin. It's all in your mind. Like he got crack psychosis through it. Like where, you know, he got paranoid and stuff like that. I went to pick him up after a day in rehab. He phoned me and said, I can't do it. I went, right, well, come on then. I'm not going to force you to do something. Who put him in rehab? Me. I put him in rehab. I contacted the drug service. Did you? Yeah, and said, he needs to go to rehab. But I, you can't force something to change unless they're going to change. So how long were you at this before you, before you decided? Or, you know, was there a turning point where... There was. He phoned me one night. I got drunk. Oh. Not seen him for about two days. He left voicemail and he very rarely cries, Marvin. And he was crying and he was saying, I can't do this no more. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. So I phoned him back and he was like, oh, I thought like, you didn't want to speak to me. So I said, oh, Marvin, just come home. Like, just come home. He's still grafting and bits and then he goes to jail and he was like, I can't do it anymore. Five and a half years we was together before we changed. But you always knew he would? Yeah. Always. Always. I think there's reasons around to why you change because of what happened to me and I was getting to the point where I couldn't do the jail visits anymore because what happens when you've got a partner and they go to jail right you kind of like you're really upset at the beginning right so say you've got six weeks in jail for the first week I'm heartbroken but then you get into your own routine and you your routine of letters and phone calls and prison yeah and then it comes out and then it disrupts my routine and then it's the same cycle. Yeah, of course it is. So then every time it hurts you like a little bit more and a little bit more. And that's what I took towards the end of it. I couldn't. Did you tell him that? Call, obviously? Yeah, I told him that. I, t I told him that I cannot. See, we have to go to what we're going to talk about to know why part of why Marvin stopped. Yeah. He stopped for himself. When you're an addict, you cannot change for someone because it's never going to work. You've got to change for yourself. So like all the rehab and it, it just didn't work for him. He didn't know any other life. He just didn't. That's not my story to tell though, is it? No. No, rehab, uh, I read a really good book, me, and true to life and it was about rehab and I weren't shocked, but when I read it, I just thought, fuck. Cause you know, if you've never been, if you've never taken drugs, you've never been to rehab. Yeah, I'm thinking, well, obviously, I'm thinking you, you go in there to get well. And then somebody who's going from street rehab, when they get in there, the people in there are saying, have you brought anything in with you? Yeah. Do you want some of this? Mm -hmm. Do you want some of this? It's fucking full of drugs. Mm -hmm. People carry on taking drugs. Because some people are only in there for a court order. They're not in there because they want to change. Because that's what they started doing a years ago, didn't they? They'd give you a drug rehabilitation yeah, order. So the people that was in there didn't want to be in there. You just didn't want to go to jail? I've known quite a few drug workers and were at a game and to be honest, they just worked, one of them worked at it for a good 20 years and just heart broke because it's just, you know, you get little glimpses are open that and fuck all. So if you deal with like a thousand people, you might get 10 who go on. And, and then half the other And the rest of it is just dead. knock back and same shit, different day bollocks. Yeah, well, I couldn't do that. I couldn't do it. My mother went to train as a drug worker. Like, he was doing the training, he would have got a really good job. He couldn't do that, because he knew these people was lying to his face. Like, he knew these people. Like, he knew they didn't want to get clean. He knew they were scoring drugs and still out grafting. He said, I can't do it. I can't have people lying in my face. Is, is there any point that during all this that you got your bipolar sorted? Mm. What were you like on drugs and drink? Just crazy. At this point, I didn't, re I didn't really take drugs at this point. I didn't take drugs at this point, but I was a big drinker. I sit there and drink a full bottle of vodka myself. I was I was a drinker through, like obviously what happened with Mark. 
drugs, but I never took drugs. Not then. Have you ever had any counselling or shit for any of that stuff? No. No. Not for the mark bit. I'm, I'm always aware when, uh, that you know, you might have a month worth of nightmares now or something, or... But you know what now? You're looking cool as fuck. I feel better. You'd look fucking way better than... Obviously, you were super nervous before first, but you've, you're almost sort of confident and in flow, and... I think it's just took me a long time. Like, this has always been my pain. Like, didn't want to inflict it on anyone else until I met you. And then I remember saying to you, I'll do my story, but only with you. Yeah, will you stop it? You know, you get super emotional. Yeah, you're getting a bit um, rad. Yeah, I can't, help it. I, can't, I can't help it. Do you know what I mean? Because, you know, when you know people and you can you can see, do you know what the you know, word that people get pissed off or they get upset at? Right, when when you use the words like damaged goods, but if I said that, you'd know what I mean, wouldn't yeah, of you? Of course, because that's how it's you... so so. You, you sp the first time we spoke, fucking hell, hairs on back of my neck. When we were talking, and you and you're sort of thinking, fucking, it's like you know you straight away, but some of the shit, obviously, was uh, heavy, and and it. So you you can see that someone. You can see that some another word. I'm going to ask you this as well because this has gone through my mind because I knew we were going to do this for the last week and it's pissing me off because I can't help my thought process. See, people going about uh, victims and survivors, and some people go, "I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor." And other people, it it it's, it's it's it don't mean anything that does it. End of day, you've been through what you've been. Yeah. So if someone called you a survivor, you won't be upset, would you? And no. if they said you were a victim, you won't be upset. I think it's some people like. When they say you're a victim, you see the look of p pity right. on the face. They pity if on... I said that though, I I wouldn't be. No. Nah. I I'd be looking at the person thinking, fucking hell. Yeah. That's heavy shit. Yeah. Not, you know, sort of looking down on someone or saying something like that. Um. Oof. Where are we going next? <laughs> um. So we go to the main part then. Yeah. So. We're living in Garton. Marvin's still grafting, obviously, he's still a drug Still addict. very young. Yeah, I'm 21 at this point. 2012, we're just about to be 22. I'd got myself a little job. I'd stopped grafting. I only stopped grafting because I got a suspended sentence. I can't go to jail. I just can't go to jail. It's not the jail, I can't follow rules. I don't want to be locked up, I'm a girl. Like, you know, it's not nice when girls go to jail and I've got my little dog at home. The only thing I could do, and I got a job, and I got a, got a job. Was Be that a near miss? So you thought, right, that's it, now I've got to change. Yeah, I got tagged. I got put, you don't want to tag on your leg as a girl, do you? I was going to jail, the judge said it, only that I got a job, and it got confirmed that I got a job. I would have gone to jail that day. So was that, that your turning point? Yeah, that was my massive turning point, to just like be like, right, you know, get a job. And I, so I... Did a trial and then the next day I got a phone call. Marvin was locked up again. So I'm like, oh, fuck's sake, no, here we go again. Did, did he not give you a clue? You'd know when he'd be off for days, you'd know if you couldn't get if you couldn't get hold of him. I'd know everyone that he was with, so I'd phone round and say, Have you seen him? No, I'd go into the shops in town where his mates worked. Have you seen him? No. One night, I remember going to this crack house. It's just over there. And I'm, I'm, I knew me, there was people in there because there was a mobile phone charging on the side. So I'm quite drunk. And I've got half... The window was open and I've got half my leg in and half my leg out. And this police car pulls up. And I can be done for burglary. They went, you all right, Kara? <laughs> Looking for Marvin? So I went, yeah, they went, on you go then because you'll find him quicker than us. And then I get the phone call. He's locked up. I'm up in... Um, not giving me bail. So I'm going to Strange Ways. It's like, all right then. So I go to work that day. I'm absolutely buzzing. Now I've got my own job, got my little flat and my little dog. And I'm just about finding peace in my life after Mark. It's took me from 15 to nearly 22. Which isn't a long time to for me. No, it's not. Not for that shit. Not with everything that went through, through the middle. Because don't forget, I got told through 
what he did to me, I couldn't have kids. I imagine you you just nearly turning 16 and someone sets you down goes, you know what the possibility of having, to having kids is 99%. So that sent me off the rails. So like, you know, I'm, as an Irish woman, you know, it sounds dead finger. That's what we do. Like yeah. we bear children. Are you Catholic? Me, yeah, I'm Catholic. Shaking again. Though. I'm shaking again. <laughs> yeah, you're all right. You're all right. You're all right. You're, cool. you're good. So I go out and I was like a couple of drinks with my work weights, you know, celebrate me getting my new job. So I had to be in work the next morning. So on my first day. So I go, my mate phones me and says, oh, we're having a few drinks. It's only around the corner from my flat. So I said, all right, I'll come. But when I've got there, they're all a bit drunk. And I'm thinking, oh, no, I'm not. New job. So, yeah. And then I've had a bit of a tiff with my mate. And I've gone, oh. So I've phoned myself a taxi. It's around the corner. It's don't even move off the meter. And this taxi driver comes and he goes, you need to give me money up front. So I'll give him a 20 pound note. He went, no, I've got another 20 pound note. And the way that he was giving off vibes and the way he was speaking to me, I'm thinking, no, there's not something right with this taxi driver. But it's a firm that I've always used. It's my dad's mates. Yeah. I've walked down this path many a times. So to me, yeah, it's 10 to 12 at night, but to me, I feel safe. Like, I'm a strong person. And on this road, you can only drive one way down this road. And when you get onto this road, you can't get off it, like, say, over there you can cut through, or over there you can cut through. It's just, like, one way. So I'm walking, and I'm thinking, I'm getting to the bottom, and my flat is just within sight, and I'm thinking, oh, thank God I'm nearly home. And next minute, my face goes to one side, and I'm thinking, yeah, what's going on here? And I feel another thump to my face, and I'm like, I'm saying it out loud, like, this is not happening to me. So I've looked. And I've seen this guy and he's dragged me, like, by me, yeah? Me, you not. I've gone to him, do you know who you're fucking with? Like that. So, I'll say this a bit slowly, but... No, it's <laughs> So... <clears throat> it's all right. So, um, yeah. So, I'm getting dragged about, like, by me area and stuff, and I'm thinking, what the fuck's going on? I've got my mobile phone in my hand, but before, my having known got locked up the day before, but before we got locked up, he gave me, you know, some money. Like to keep me going because he knew he wouldn't get out. And I've put the money like, you know, in between my bra. So I'm got thrown on the floor and I've got my handbag, whatever. I actually broke my toe in the process of it. And I've gone like that. Yeah, I just, you know, take the money, what you're doing. And he's gone. Put it all back in my handbag and he went, It's not about the money. I'm thinking, what's going on about? This guy's he's skinny as a rake, he's smaller than me. But I'm like froze and he's gone. It's about teaching little bitches that you can't walk the street with men like me. So I know now it's serious. I know 100% it's serious. Are you going to say something now? No. So, like, obviously, I, I, I'm getting, like, absolutely battered here. And my shoes have come off. Next thing I know, like, the guy's trying to take my pants off. My T-shirt's already come off. Like, it's got rips with my bra. And I'm thinking, you know what? No. Like, I'd rather die than you take that from me. I'm not going to go back. Like, this is my time to go forward. I'm not doing it. So, I'm like, right, right, right. I'll do, you know, I'll do what you want. Just, like, stop hitting my kind of thing. Cause there's blood. Like, I'm covered in it. And he drags me by my leg across this road. Have you got something on his face? He had something on his mouth. But you could see his eyes, like piercing blue eyes. So he had like, you know, like them bellies that cover your hair and yeah. cover there, but yeah. you can see the yeah. eyes. So he had one of them on him. And there's a thing that in court, like, they want to do things their way. I've said to this day, there was two of them there. Because I heard someone go, you said it wasn't meant to be like this. So I'm assuming he's told this person, look, we're only going to go and rob her. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So he's dragged me into these bushes and I'm like, look, I'll do what you want. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking, no. Now, I could never punch with my left fist. And Marvin used to train me to box. And he taught me how to punch with my left. Now, remember I said, you can't go that way up the road. Well, this car's not spotted the, the sign. And it's gone to drive up. And the headlights have beamed. And as he's gone like that, I've gone fuck off and smacked him. As I'm running, he's dragged me back by my leg. And I'm kicking out. I'm half naked and like I've pushed him and I've ran and I'm thinking I can't go home I'm banging on people's doors I'm drenched in blood and no one's opening the doors to me they're coming to the window 
and nobody is helping me. So I remember trying this woman's door and it was open and I ran in like absolutely hysterical. My phone was gone, my handbag was gone. So I had no way of like phoning anyone. And I remember running in saying, phone my dad. And she was like, don't touch anything. Don't, you know, there's blood everywhere. So I knew my dad's number off the top of my heart. He had it till the day he died. And she said, I've got to put it on loudspeaker. I can't, you know, you've got blood all over you. So I'm screaming, like, I'm, because I'd been knocked out. Like, I'd lost consciousness when I was getting dragged across the road. And I've you know, come round and I'm screaming, out with daddy. But as this woman's telling me to calm down, my dad's shouting at her, leave my child alone. He's thinking she's attacking me. Yeah. So an ambulance got called and it was a male like paramedic and I went absolutely like crazy. They ended up sedating me because all I could see was this guy and I'm saying, stop it, stop it. So the, I said to him, I want my dad. At the time, my dad had collapsed spine, so he couldn't, he couldn't really walk. And at the time, we, he had breathing problems and we never knew like what was causing him. And um, so they took me to the hospital and my mum come. And I remember saying to my mum, what are you doing here? And it asked you, like, just random, like, out the blue. And then I go into hospital and I just remember I'm going in and out of consciousness. And um, obviously the police have come. They've took on, you know, pictures of me injuries. Took me for an x-ray. My nose was broke. My eye socket was broke. Um, bite marks all over my bruises, got broken toe, fingernail got ripped off, hair got ripped out, just absolutely horrific injuries. And so the police have come in, they took a statement and said like, we need to take your clothes from you. So I said, do you want to put a hospital gown on? I went, no, go and get me a change of clothes from my house. I'm on autopilot. Like to me, I'm thinking this is not happening again. Like I've not already been through enough. Like what more? I've got to prove to my, you know, to the world that I want to live a peaceful life. And I remember them trying to put me on this ward and this woman going, oh, did your boyfriend do that to you? Well, that was it, I lost it. I went, I'm discharging myself. The police went, you can't. I went, well, you're not having none of my clothes unless you let me discharge myself. When my handbag went missing in the process, obviously I've had a provisional driving license. I've had letters in it. So my address is there. But my dog's at home. And my little dog, she was my world. So I goes to my mum's like my dad just. I have never ever seen my dad cry the way he cried. And then you know what? I felt guilty. I felt embarrassed that I'd upset my dad once again. Even though, looking at it now, obviously it wasn't my fault. Oh. So we've gone to my mum's and like the police have like took like a statement and then they phoned me on the Sunday and they said like you've got to come in for oh no what happened is he's took my mobile so this was at five past twelve I got attacked I was out of hospital for eleven o'clock the next morning and I needed my mobile because remember Marvin got locked up so when you lose a phone you can always get your number back you just go into the sim providers yeah I remember going to my mum's putting a tracksuit on and I was in town getting a new phone. I couldn't even see out my eyes. My mum saying, why don't you put some sunglasses on? I'm like, no, people want to stare, let them stare. Like, I was literally running on adrenaline. Like, I remember going in and the guy in the phone shop saying, what's happened to you? And I went, oh, we've got to tap me. And my friend's looking at me and she's saying, Kerry, you need to go home, mate. Like, you're not well. So when I get my number changed and I'm sat in my sister's, and my phone starts ringing. And I'm getting loads of abuse on the phone by different people saying, why have you sent text messages to my girlfriend's phone saying you're gonna rape her and you're gonna do this to her? And I'm like, what are you on about? Then I'm getting text messages and voicemails. So I'm like, no, that's what happened to me. And they're like, you're lying. I had to get the police to trace the calls. They literally thought it was me. It wasn't, it was him using my phone to contact girls that he'd been stalking on the internet or girls that he'd like you know that had the numbers on facebook or whatever it was or friends of a friend so i'm like no it's not me so the police goes um 
I did me, does me an, you know, your interview. God, that goes on for so long. They said to me, I've never seen a person that can just talk the way you talk without taking a breath. And they said to me, we need to put it in the paper. I was like, no, no, it's not going in the paper. My boyfriend's in jail. So they went, right, we'll put it in the paper. In what context? They wanted to put your name and that you'd been attacked and everything. Mm. To, like, they wanted to appeal for the driver that tried to drive up the road. Yeah. That's who they was appealing yeah. for. So he said, okay then, we won't put your name in it, but we'll say your age and the street and like what area. So I'm like, okay, fair enough. So I'm thinking, I need to tell Marvin, but like somehow he's gonna find out his ear stretches this long. So I remember phoning the prison and speaking to, is it the chaplain that you speak to? Yeah. And I'm saying I need to get a visit, but obviously he needed to wait for his VOs. So he said, right, well, you know, we'll get you a visit with him. But he is going to come out under more security. You know, Marvin's got a reputation in jail. Yeah. And he's going to be under the security camera. One thing goes wrong, he's getting dragged off the visit. So I'm like, okay then, no problem. In all that story, this is the most scariest thing that I've ever had to do. To walk on that visit, I remember seeing this screen, he was like, oh my Were God. Were you still a mess? This is two days later. Oh, I got attacked on the Saturday, this is on the Monday. Wow. He's up in court on the Wednesday to see right, if he's getting, going, doing his sentence or he's doing it suspended. And I remember being petrified walking in this jail because I knew, like, Shit was, he'd only just got locked up the, the day before yeah, I got attacked. We know that he's looking at six months this time, the longest that we've been apart, apart from when he did that. And I remember walking in and there was a woman that I knew walking at the side of me, so we couldn't really see. And as I've turned, he's gone to uplift the table, but obviously the, the yeah. nail, nailed down and four screws just jumped. And I just walked over and I went, Marvin, they're gonna drag you off this visit. You can have a sit down and listen to me, or you, you don't know. And he went, it was you. I went, what was me? He went, it was you in the paper. He guessed it, he'd guessed the area. He knew where my friend lived from oh. Tanya de Brow, and obviously yeah. he knew me. He went, it was you. One of the boys was reading it. And when I kill him, I'm gonna, I was like, you need to calm down, have you? It broke my heart because I knew in some way he blamed himself. You can't blame yourself. No. But you're gonna obviously. Yeah, of course. Then he goes to court two days later. I turned up, I always turn up at court. I wrote a letter to the judge, so did the police explaining look like she needs support. She just turned around and she went, I don't care what's happened to you. He's going to jail. And they gave him sixteen weeks and he had to serve. No, they didn't. They gave him eight weeks and he had to serve four. And I remember screaming at him going it's on you this now like i'm out here on my own and i've never heard him like kara kara and i remember just walking out of there thinking fuck this world like i just cannot be asked with it and then my mum was like you need to live there and i was like no i'm going i'm going back to my own flat and the way our flat looks like um a house so what i do is i put my couch up at one door and my dryer up at another door you know so if someone knocks on my door yeah. and they have my little dog so she kind of you know, she made me feel safe. But obviously, I know, you know, he's still out there. And he's got your address. He's got me address, like, you know, he knows things about me. So, then, this was in the May. I went back to work two weeks later. What, what, he said, you can come back to work when there's no bruises on your face, because I was a waitress. So I said, right, so I've gone back to work. I'm going through the motions, like, I would never tell people that I was at home on my own. So if my brother asked, I'd say, oh, my friend's here. Or if she asked, I'd say, oh, my brother's there. I didn't trust anyone. I didn't even trust my own parents. I felt like, could it be you? Could it be you? Could it be you? Really? Yeah. Could it be my brother? Like, could it be his mate? Everybody was a suspect. Everybody. <clears throat> and then... Marvin got out of jail and he was out for, he was only out a few days, went back to jail and he, this night he was on the rampage trying to find this guy but obviously he was still doing what he was doing and he got locked up and that's what just, 
that's when I knew, look, I can't do this anymore. Like, I tried to kill myself. You did then? Yeah, did, when it happened, I tried to hang myself. Really? Yeah, I just, literally, I could not take one more thing. And I remember walking on the visit and saying, Marvin, this is it, like, this is the final time I'm gonna walk into this jail. I've got my own shit going on. Like, I need you, I'm scared. And he said, I promise you, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna change. I'll never go back to jail. And you know what? He never ever went back to jail, never. He come out of jail with a spice addiction and never touched crack. Never ever touched the crack after that. He got a spice addiction, so we replaced one from the other. So time has passed and it's on, September comes, I'll never forget it was my nephew's first birthday. And I had a great police officer, he's called Matt. Oh, he's, he was lovely. And they phones me and they go, we've got him. And I'm like, what? He was like, we've got him. Oh my God, my, my head fell off. So they said, we need to come right and see ya. That's when the whole story, I just put, tumbling out like I wasn't I wasn't the first person I was one of six not at the time I wasn't I was the one uh, there was four girls that got attacked before me um it got f found at the crime at the scene of the last woman stay majors my mum she still eats through a straw she's got no teeth um We'd attacked another girl. I got really good friends with her, I still am to this day. And he tried to drown her in the reservoir. And he actually went home and Googled woman dead in the in Garton Reservoir. Like he knew exactly what he you know he'd done. And anyway, someone intervened at the last one and he was like, No, I'm trying to help her. No one else had a description of him apart from me. Well, his eyes, but he had piercing blue eyes. Um I was gonna forget what I was gonna say. So yeah, the police said like we found like we we found him. We're gonna go like search his address. Like they'd found my phone in his girlfriend's knicker drawer. Apparently she didn't know nothing about it. Then they raided his mum's house, where they found a bookshelf of all books lined up, how to strangle women, how to mutilate women, best way to asphyxiate someone, blah blah blah. They found all that. And then, so it begins, the trial begins. Set me off my head. In between that time, when I got attacked, I was 14 stone. By the time I got to court, I was seven stone. Really? Seven stone. I got bulimia. How many months were that? I got attacked in the May. This was in the October we went to court. In the October we went to court and it was so bad. I went from fitting in size 18 clothes to then four to six clothes used to hang off me. I just wanted to change. I just didn't, you know, I wanted to look different so people didn't know who I was. I've become a very, very angry, paranoid person. Well, you know, what, what can I say? I can't even imagine, I can't imagine. Like, through bulimia, I got a thing called body dysmorphia. So even though people were saying to me, you've lost too much weight, I'd think, you're so lying. Like, look at me. Like, I'm so big. Like, look at me. So then you got ready for the court case. Like, he's running a trial. He's actually saying he's not guilty. So it comes to court and then... How many witnesses were there? Well, there were six girls. His mum was a witness. His girlfriend was a witness. The three people that helped the last woman was witnesses, so. Because you're not allowed to sit in on every day. You're not allowed to sit in while anyone else is no. giving evidence. No. So, and then it, you know, they build you up for the, like, the court case, and then they say, look, he's going not guilty. Here's his defence. He's seen you get attacked and he's run over to help you. Really? Then. He drove a white van and they, obviously they go through everything, don't they? So they've gone through receipts and he was at a petrol station. And how it come about is he's seen me come onto Tanya Brow and thought she can't get off Tanya Brow. 
So he waited for me. Like, he waited a good however long it took me. And that's when he attacked me. This is what, you know, the police gathered. And then they said, look, we found these books in his house. So I was like, oh, my God, his mum's owning up that she bought them. I was like, what? He's got a pregnant girlfriend at the time. So, you know, you're going to have to sit on the stand and give evidence. Like, he's, you know, he's denying it. Scariest time of my life. I've I, never, ever sat... I've never sat, like, on a stand. I've never, like, even with Mark, I've never had to give evidence. You know, he's in the courtroom. His family are sat in front of me and my family going slacks. Slacks. Like, why? Why is it our fault? The... You know, the thing is, right, we grew up, even though I had no, we all, st we struggled, like, I didn't have, like, a privileged background, you know, his dad owned his own business, like, he didn't come from anything where you could say, oh, I had a hard childhood, this is why I did it, he worked for St John's Ambulances, but what, we didn't know until after the court case, he was already under the police radar for flashing women, and then I found out how I became so unconscious. You put chlorophyll over, Chloroform over, yeah. over my mouth and over every. The police said the only thing that saved me from coming round had been knocked out that many times off Mark. Really? So my body was used like to like a boxer. You get yeah. used to being punched. Yeah. So that's the only reason that I come round because he got charged with attempted murder. There was four charges on me: attempted murder, attempted rape, um, GBH. I think section 18, I might like, just like all my like charges like that. So I, I've obviously you have to go to the police station and watch you. They make you watch your two hour police interview. Yeah. Then the day I'm meant to go to court, the police officer rings me and he says, it's been delayed. You can't give your evidence today. I just said to him, you know what? I'm not giving evidence. You're all pissing me off. So he's like, let's, you know, go for a drink and talk about this. I said, no. I went out and got absolutely drunk. I was literally at the... I'm sick of people telling me, it's going to be all right. It's, you know, he'll go to jail. Like, you you know, you're strong. I don't want to be strong anymore. Like, I've had up to where we're being strong. So, obviously, I did go next morning. They come and pick me up for court. Didn't know he'd be in the courtroom. And then I think what's hard is they make you go to another part of the courtroom and they make me watch my video evidence and the jury are watching it and the judge and he's watching it and they're like making them watch it to see if I get upset or if I find it amusing to see whatever facial expressions that I've got yeah. so then they'll know whether I'm lying or I'm not lying so I did that and then I got on the stand I did ask for a screen at last minute I changed my mind but they won't pull the screen down I didn't know why at the time but then I found out after and I'll tell you what, I do not like defence lawyers. I absolutely despise them. Because see people like me, like you said, a victim. Yeah. We're just a paycheck. Like, they don't really care about us. We're just someone that pays off of car finance or someone that pays the mortgage. The way that barrister spoke to me was disgusting. The pr pr prosecution barrister, the one that we had, he was absolutely brilliant. He literally basically sat there and said, you, you're lying, aren't you? Like... You met up with him. He had all these things. And I remember saying to him, do not call me a liar. And the judge saying, don't speak to him like that. I went, no, don't call me a liar. You don't know how it feels. How can you sit here and say, like, we're lying? Sorry. It's all right. I, like, I'm not lying. <laughs> and then, like, they put, they put you under that and it goes on for weeks and weeks and they're asking the same questions and the same questions. How long did the trial last? Just over six weeks. Fucking hell. So obviously we're going to court, like when I give my evidence, I wouldn't let my family be in the courtroom. I won't want, no. And then obviously his girlfriend comes, you come with a baby. It's like you're taking the piss. You're denying knowing anything. My phone was found in your drawer, you change your underwear every day. And they're calling, calling me names. Well, Marvin lost it. Don't forget his spice addict. addict. Spice is just like the worst thing you take yeah. for your brain. And he goes over to me and went, if you don't get out of this courtroom, I'm going to boot your baby over the tram line. They banned him out of court for three days just to annoy me that little bit more. People don't understand if they've never been to court. It is not a friendly place, is it? 
absolutely not you've got this it's hostile panel of people and they've got basically your life in in their hands are they going to believe me are they not going to believe me then you've got all like little lawyers big lawyers it's, it's scary where are, where are you looking i can't even imagine where I'm, when i'm giving evidence yeah right at that barrister's eyes like, you're not going to call me a liar i'm not a liar i know what happened he knows what happens i took i sold him on the stand you don't care about us you just care about getting paid the man that's defending me cares you know you've got i said to him you've got all the evidence there in front of you you know he's guilty like why are you trying to well, defend him see i have a problem <laughs> I understand people are entitled to defence and things like that, but sometimes how these things work. I think, right, if the evidence is right there in front of you, right, and they could, there's DNA evidence, there's, you know, there's physical evidence, there's cameras, there's, you know, where he's seen stalking the women, there's receipts where he's saying that he wasn't there, his mum's saying he was in bed, you don't even live with your mum, you live with your girlfriend. This is how he met his girlfriend, just randomly one night. In, apparently off the police in a graveyard like what are you doing in a graveyard like you know he, he wasn't even that old neither he was only 31 at the time this was nine years ago so he, you know and then they put you on the they put you on the stand and then you can't go for a few days because other people are giving evidence and then it comes to closing speeches and it's like when that defense barrier gets up there he's giving it the spiel and for one minute you're thinking you're out oh, he's gonna me? win yeah you no know, he's gonna win until my defence barrister got up and just absolutely ripped into him. So, like, you don't know, like, what's going to happen. Like, it's going to go either way. I goes home, closing speeches, goes back the next day, the police introduced me to this girl. She's the one that got through in the reservoir. Ter it was really bad what happened to her. She'd only just lost a son's dad the day before. Wow. It, she, you know, she same age as me, she had a little boy. He was only three at the time. You know, she, she was a lovely girl that like the police introduced us because we was the only one that went back. I mean, we were getting there at nine o'clock, about half ten, they went to Geordie's in. And I, went up. I was like, this is it, they found them not guilty. Like, found them not guilty. So the police have come in with us. And like, they're sat behind me, I'm sat there. And like, they say, like, if you reached a verdict, he's up on 15 charges altogether. So you've got to start from the first bit, term, and you've got to wait all the way yeah. to the end. So on the fourth. So if you, when they was writing, reading out like, yeah, he's got found guilty for this, and you cry, the judge would say, you can't cry, you're not allowed to cry. You'd be like, what? You're not allowed to cry. And then it come to mind, and still in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, this, this guy didn't, doubting not yourself. guilty. I'm looking at him, he's, he's, he didn't smirk, he didn't, he just, Looked right at me, just like he could see through me. Like, he didn't flinch when he was going guilty, guilty, guilty. Like, this this guy had never been arrested in his life, let alone, you know, gone to jail. Yeah. And then they come to my four charges, and once he said the first guilty, I remember trying to get up out of the chair, crying my eyes out, saying, I can't do this. And the police officer got my shoulders and literally pinned me down. He went, no, you've got to do this. Like, you literally have got to do this. So then he got found guilty in all charges. Then obviously, you, you know, you have a sentencing day, comes outside, the press are everywhere. Like it's an open court, the press are allowed in. Press are everywhere, I'm like, you know, just leave me alone. And I remember the forewoman of the juror walking over to me crying and she threw her arms around me. She was like, I always believed you. Like she's just, an average person, you know, she's not going to university to get a degree. She's just, oh. you no, know, a, a woman that's probably retired, like she was in her sixties, and she said to me, "I promise you, I'm going to come back for sentencing." So I was like, "Oh, that's dead nice, that." So I don't know. You try to go home and you try and everyone thinks, "All oh, right, it's been found guilty. It's fine. It's gone away now." Well, you, you know. Probably been talking about this 20 minutes. I can't even imagine how long that was. Probably seemed like years to you. Yeah, yeah. All of it, build up to it, being in court, everything else. Yeah, you become numb. You become. I become only now since having my son. Have you still got the eating problem and everything? Yeah, I will. I will always have that. Like, I can ask Marvin 20, 30 times. I don't know why you put something on. Do you think I put weight on? You've asked me five minutes ago. Yeah, but do you think I put weight on? No, you look fine. I hate the word fine. Fine, fine's not a word. So you, you do think I put weight on? I remember that. 
So, so how long was it between getting found guilty and sentencing? Six weeks. Six weeks. So two days before sentencing, I thought, like, I want to do something. Like, sentencing to me is let's close this chapter. So I went out and got this. Unbreakable. Because you know why? You can break my face. You can break whatever bones you want in my body. You can't break me. You can't break my spirit. <laughs> so I did. Don't start yeah. me off. I've done well up to now. Yeah. And that's what it meant to me. You can break anything, but you can't break me. No. So that's what I was. And then me and my whole Dingle clan went to court. Did you allow your family to go? Yeah. yeah. Even my dad went. My dad went. And we went, you know, to court. And there was a couple of girls there that I'd not met. And this woman was there from Majora and two other women. And this courtroom was somewhere else. It was like massive and he, you know, he's, he's down there. His auntie, his mum, they're all still there. Like, what are you doing? He's been found guilty. I never, I never, ever I've got a son. I never understand. I've, I've got a son and let me tell you, it, 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 that'd just be it. Like, you know, you, where have you gone wrong to have a sex offender as a child? You've basically said that you've taught him well, I think, yeah. how to do it. Like, he really didn't like women. He hated them. What is it? You've got mummy issues. Like, deal with them. I think sex offenders put you a bit like they love. Yeah, it is. To be honest. It's an absolute animal. So, what did he get? So, we goes into our statements are read out. We're not allowed to read our statements out for some reason. This judge was just dead fingering on about was all getting emotional. And um, the judge actually said, what is the most scariest thing about you? Is any of these seeing you in the street, they won't cross over and think, oh my God, he looks like he's gonna attack me. And he got sentenced to life with a recommendation of 29 years. And he still didn't blink. Marvin jumps, stood up, claps, he walks straight out. My brother <laughs> shouting things. And I just shouted down with, and he looked at me and I went, you didn't teach me nothing, did you? You can't keep little bitches like us off the street. And that was it, then he went to jail. I obviously fucking know this, don't I? Yes, you do. This is why I agreed to tell my story with you. That is, I never ever had any intention since before I met you to ever tell my story. I've had ample opportunities. This creature we're talking about, I'm using that as a very, again, being overly kind, was on the healthcare at Strange Ways, come on to healthcare, he was on there for months. I didn't like him. Uh, I didn't trust him. He was on an unlock pretty much all the time he was on there, you know, and the first time we met, didn't we? Mm -hmm. You were talking about something that had happened. And I fucking you just knew. looked at me and you went, Sammy, his name, I know who you're talking about. Yeah, it was. That's why I decided to tell my story. Like, you asked me why I'm so comfortable around you and I trust you. That's because you already know me before you knew me. Yeah. Like, you never looked at me with like that, you know, that pitter look that, you know, some people do, but, um, you know, yeah, that's of human go, nature. Yeah, of course they do. And the other thing is that people don't know what other people have been through, do they? It yeah. can be judgmental. Um. I, I don't understand court, I don't understand families, you know, calling you slag sluts or whatever and things like that when something like that. Shocking. It's absolutely shocking, the system. And the thing is, you know, pe people go on about... It, it's not... A f I, I sat through pretty much pretty similar sort of thing, rape case as a prison officer, you know, escorting a prisoner. Fucking hell. Terrible. It's all that, you know, you're innocent. It's hostile. It's hostile. Um, like you say, people go at you and you start doubting yourself and things like that when they haven't got a clue, have they? No, they, they haven't. They have not got a single clue what you've been through without the trial, what you've been through up to that, how it's affected you, because obviously it'll affect you for the rest of your life. Yeah, of course. Um, the eating disorder, you know, we've talked about that plenty. Uh, you know it'll be something that's there, something you're conscious about. Yeah, of something course. Something you'll need help with. Yeah, of course. It's like, I remember, 
and he got found guilty the barrister coming out going well done i've not just passed an exam and i remember him going to the prosecutor best man won like it's, it's not a joke you don't exactly like, do let's you... go for a drink mate I we are human See, beings well, do, do you know what it's not even professional that is it no it's not you know it's it's bitterness and it's it's inexcusable yeah of course it is they just don't care though do they do they fuck that's why i can't stand them no no it's not not a friendly place like you say that 20 minutes were probably longest months of your life yeah absolutely a hundred percent how do you feel now karma no i actually thought i was gonna cry you've had me <laughs> But you know, it is, you can't <coughs> help it though. If you know someone and uh, pff, you know him, I. Do you know what though? That's not even where the story ends with him. Fast forward to 2019, right? He's been in jail since 2012. I've just had my baby boy by C section and I'm laying in my bed and he's got. And you never thought he'd be a mum? Never thought I'd be a mum. We'll get to that part of his story. Um, just while we're on the Adam down with a bit, that's why I'm going to say it. And um, I'm laying in my bed. Obviously, I'm recovering. He's only like five weeks old. I've been up half an hour and I've checked my phone and I've got four missed calls off my friend and two set texts off my friend. Call me, call me. I'm thinking, what's got with your Pablo? It's what's got around for the bro. And I've got missed calls off my older brother and text messages off him. And then Marvin comes in, he went, Cares, I've got something to tell you. So I went, What? He went, Adam's in the paper, you know, so I went, what? I don't, I don't want to know, I don't want to know. That's all I said, I don't want to know. His front page, my brother phones me. I went, yes, I know, put the phone down. And as the day's going on, curiosity is eating me up. So I wait for the baby to go to sleep and I wait for my heart to go to sleep. I just had to know. Well, lo and behold, his front page news, because his little brother's a nonce. He'd been grooming 12-year-old girls online. Now, let's go back to the beginning of the story where I will still say 100% there was another person there when I got attacked. And when the police said he had a brother, I said, you need to look into the little brother. No, he's a straight A student. You know, like, it's definitely not him. And then his brother's in the paper. What did he, what did he get? He got a conditional discharge because he's never been in trouble. He was trying to have sex with 12 year old girls. Wrong. He was stalking girls just exactly where his brother was. It's it's madness. Wrong, isn't it? And then I'm reading the story. All right, I know it's an open court and the papers can print what they want. They've printed my full statement, word for word, like what I'd said in court. It's like you've dragged it all back up again. And at the time, I didn't know I had postnatal psychosis. Like, I just thought, you know, you're emotional. And it, it just set, sets things off again. That's why I took a lot of shit down me, because of people like yourself. However, <sighs> so since then, because that's not that long ago, is it? No. After that, I moved. I didn't feel safe. So I moved and I moved to visit. Yeah, my family was actually on the same street as my big brother. Things was going pretty all right. Like, things was, you know, it was going all right. And then, about six months after. Because, see, I was going to the doctors back and forth since I was, like, 13. And then this new doctor come and he went, he used the word manic depressant. He went, so I had to wait a year. Yeah, yeah fucking that is the word for it. That, that is the word for it. it perfect. Yeah, manic and depressed. Yeah, stick your bipolar. I don't even know what, like, where they even come up with that word. Some political correctness, some knobhead somewhere decided. Get by to type 1 and type 2. Yeah, yeah. So I've got type 2. So I had to wait a year to see a psychiatrist and then you go for him. You know, many interviews with him. And I remember saying to me, yeah, you've got bipolar. And everyone's upset. I'm like, what, you're all upset? Do you know what I was? I was grieved. Yeah, because you've got a di diagnosis. Hooray. Yeah, for I'm Ray, not fucking nuts. I'm not mad. Like, there is something wrong with me. You know, it was hard to deal with, but at least I know now. Yeah. I've always said that, me, love. You know, if you're ill or something's going on, finding out, for me, is the one so you know you can, like, deal with it or whatever. Whereas, 
I don't, I, you see, the, the problem is, as a kid, you go to a doctor or whatever, you're just a kid, aren't you? Hormones, mm -hmm. teenager, grow out of it, yeah. it, you know. It's pathetic. It is, it's pathetic. <sighs> but yeah, some, you know, most doctors now will diagnose three, four-year-olds with, you know, ADHD because they're going through, like, you know, your little terrible little Tubes. stage. Yeah, terrible do you know Tubes. what I mean? Yeah. And, you know, they're quick to diagnose that as naughty children. Yeah. But then they're not quick to help well, it's you. It's all industry, isn't it? Yeah, of course. It's all about making money, isn't it? That's what it is. So, uh, manic depressive, your meds for life. For life. The eating disorder keeps cropping up now and again. Yeah. Yeah. And that triggered really by that event. Yeah. Probably. Which yeah. Which not surprising, is it? Because he called me fat in his police statement. Really? Mm. Wow. Yeah, call me fat in his place. Is that, and is that what's stuck in your mind? Just I that? carried on being fat after that, and then I was working, <laughs> and I leaned up to get a bottle of wine in, in the bistro, and I split the arse in my pants. <laughs> so it had to stop. You know what it was? I was comfy eating mavers in jail. So I'm working all day, I'm getting home, and I'm buying a kebab for me and the dog. And this is like every you night. Don't, you don't have to explain <laughs> these things. So, um, after that, Traumatic, uh, fucking hell. But you got a kid now? I have. You're a mum? Mm hmm. Miracle baby, told you could never have kids. Mm hmm. Would you say this is probably since you were like 13 at home, probably the most settled period of your life? Do you know, I think it's the most settled from the first memory I've ever had as a child. Really? Yeah. I never, I always felt different. I always felt weird where I didn't belong, you know? And then. Just as life goes good, something knocks you back. Like then my dad got Paula. And that was the hardest time of my life. I never ever thought I'd come back from that. My dad was my absolute world. I was a daddy's girl. And he'd been poorly for a while, they say it was asthma. And it was right in the grip of my bulimia. I was running four times a day. I was going to the gym three times a day. My mum phoning me saying, oh, your dad's in hospital. Like, can you come up? And I'm like, mum, I'm just about to go for a run. So I ran the two miles to the hospital. And the words she said changed my life forever. She said, your dad's dying. I was like, what are you talking about? Your dad's got COPD. I'm like, the doctor's not know what I'm talking about. And she showed me this wreck saying he's got holes in his lungs the size of golf balls. I remember just smashing the outside of the hospital up, saying, this is just bullshit. Has anyone told him? No. I'm storming on the ward, and I'm like, you're not going to lie to him. And I get to the doctor's been round. And I just said to him, Dad, I can't be here, I've got to go on. I can't do it. I've got to go. I remember I got to get a bag of Coke, a bottle of vodka, and just getting absolutely off my cake. Like, this is... Have we as a family, as me, as a separate person, like, have we not been through enough like when is the world when gonna give this? us a break when were this this was in 2006 16 6 2016 yeah and then he got 12 months so he got told he had 12 months left my dad was only 58 57 when he got told not 58 and he got given 12 months to live do you know from that day, like, I was never the same again. I hated the world. I hated everyone in the world. I did the one thing I never thought I'd do, and I pushed Marvin away. You know, you can sit there and go, oh, it's all right, babe, and how you feel then? No, you don't. You don't know how I feel. And then, like, he was in and he was out of hospital, and he was on um, oxygen and steroids at home, and, like, he was always, like, going in hospital, and he said to me, look, if it happens again, I, I want DNA, I do not resuscitate, man. You've already told me, like, if I slip into a coma, like, I'm not going to be, you know, the same person. He wasn't living, he was just existing. And to go from a big Irish man, you know, that was fucking 18 stone, you still have got all the poor, he worked on a building site. It was a sin. You'd put a dog down for less. You really would. And then May 2018. No, May 2018. Um, I'm out with me, me and my friend in town and my sister phones me and she said, oh, no, no, I'm getting ready to go out. My sister phones me and she goes, Dad's back in hospital. You need to come up. 
So I've come up and like, he's asleep. So I says, he looks fine. The doctors are saying he's fine. Worst thing you ever did. I left. It's about four o'clock. And at 10 o'clock, half 10, my sister rang me. And she said, you've got to come to the hospital. I phoned Marvin, because they was a, oh, I swear they was the best of friends. Honest to God, they was. I mean, Marvin drove, drove my dad mad. I mean, you've seen the way Marvin acts. Yeah. And um, 26th of May, 20 days after his 59th birthday, like we all sat with him. You know, we got the priest in. All four kids was around him. Marvin came, you know, said whatever he said. And then Marvin left and then, it comes to my turn, but I don't want to cry then. All right. <clears throat> I, my God, it's all right. It's all right. <clears throat> I'd had an argument with my dad, and I stormed out the hospital, and I never spoke to him. That's all right. It don't matter. No, I know it don't. I know. But I remember like sitting there, and we always had our own song. It was called Heaven's Got a Plan For You. Child Heaven's Got a Plan For You. Because he used to always say to me, you will have a baby. You will have a baby. You won't just be the auntie. I promise you. I promise you. And um, I remember sitting there singing it to him, told her, and squeezing me on. So I knew. And then he'd not shared a bed with my mum for years. Obviously he couldn't. And she said, can I get in the bed with him? Like, said, yeah. So they took them oxygen off him. And my mum just looked at me when he's gone. I can take physical pain. I've been through enough. It's a sin to say. But I never knew your heart could hurt so bad. I never knew. And I remember my sister going to slap me because I was trying to wake him up. The nurses is in Manchester Royal. Absolutely. They don't just do a job, they change people's lives, the dignity that, you know, yeah. my dad went out with. It was unbelievable, the dignity he went out with. And I remember getting a taxi home and just thinking, like, my dad was always my go-to. Like, yeah. my, you know, I was having, my dad found it very hard with me bipolar, because he used to say, you remind me of me, like, you're just lost. It you, is difficult, it you, is a difficult yeah, thing. Yeah, you look like you just walk round like you don't belong anywhere, mister, because he never called me care until I was in trouble. And I remember getting home and just howling in in the shower and like just i was numb and then we went back to visit him at the hospital and then we just went through the motions i was just getting drunk I was sniffing cocaine like a fucking you know it was you're going just, out of fashion in it, you're just sort of but don't forget marvin's an ex addict of cocaine and like we did split up over it like i'm saying it's none of your business. I don't have a kid to you. You can't tell me what grief, to do. Grief is an individual thing, and our people cultivate. You can't. You no. cannot. No. You know. But my dad did say to me, like, don't go off the rails. Like, he planned his funeral. Like, we picked his plot. He said to me, I want you to carry my coffin. I'm in mean, an island. That's not. You don't do that. It's no. The men's do the men, and yeah, the women's do the yeah, women. Yeah. So I was like, but I'm a girl. He was like, yeah, you've got bigger balls than both your brothers put together. So I was like, all right, then if you want to say it like that. And then we had to plan the funeral, go to the funeral home. My mum was with my dad for 33 years. Her life just changed in the blink of an eye. Till to this day, she can't really walk cause she had a mental breakdown. Spent a year in um, a hospital to try and get better. Did she? Yeah. Bless. Yeah, she went into like a respite to try and get her to walk properly. She still walks with an aide now. Like my mum's on 56, my mum. Um, and then the funeral, then we brought him home because we have open coffin, Catholics. And like, everyone could touch him and I wouldn't touch him. I just wouldn't touch him. Like, I just, I just automatically go into autopilot and I always want to like look after other people. And like, I moved in with my mum, like when my dad died and like said, I'll look after you. I've gone home and done all the wake food and come back the next morning. And it's like, I'm so manic out of my head. Like, I'm like greeting everyone, like, hi, like, you all right? And then, like, everyone's going, you okay? Like, I've got a full face of makeup on, I've had my hair done. Like, I've got a dress on, I've got my heels on. My dad's going out, I'm, we're going out in style. You couldn't even see him through all the stuff we put in his coffin. 
And then my sister says the Undertaker's are rare. He's still not registering in my head. Oh. Right, all right, I'm going outside of what's said. Okay, we're going to put the lid on the coffin. It's the last time we were going to see him. I remember blocking the doorway and going, don't you dare put that lid on him. He hit me, like, you're going to take him and he ain't never going to walk back in his house. I remember having saying, you've got to let him do what they're doing. And then we did the funeral and nearly dropped him on the way in. Did you? And nearly dropped him Was on it the way heavy? In. It was heavy as fuck. But you know the thing was, right, back in the day, my dad drank <laughs> Bacardi, right? And then he stopped drinking for two, like, two years. And I remember people looking at me because I'm laughing, but I'm belly laughing. Yeah, listen. Because all I can hear is this, clink, clink, clink. I'm saying to my brother, my brother's on one side, because like, Marvin carried him as well. My brother's on one side, I'm going, I'm going to drop him. Like, these are all six foot, but yeah. my little brother. I'm on my tiptoes like this, <laughs> like trying to carry him. You have your six inch heels on or something? No, I had heels on and then I swapped them for sliders because I thought, oh, I'll go on my ass, like, you know, in heels. Yeah. But didn't think it through, like, my six turn, my brother's six foot, you know, my uncle's from Ireland, and I just thought, you just know my luck, I would drop him. Did he give him a good send off? Best send off. Best, best, best send off. We did. We did him proud. We did him proud. Getting to the graveyard and watching him, you know, be buried, I think that's like the hardest thing, but then. I think, like, when someone dies, you, the funeral gets you through and you're on autopilot. But then when it's done, it's done. That's when I had the worst breakdown of my life. I used to walk to the cemetery and jump the walls at four o'clock in the morning. Really? Sleep on top of my dad's grave, high as a kite, drunk. Really? Drunk. High as a kite, covered in mud. Fucking hell, you don't do all in half measures, you do. I'd come home covered in mud and be like, where have you been? I'd be like, been in cemetery been in the cemetery, like just constantly arguing with everyone, fighting with everyone, like once taking me meds, like phoning the doctor saying, I want to go into respite, like just put me in respite because I'm just going to end up topping myself. That's when I really, really, really got bad into, you know, taking coke. I'd say to Marvin on a Friday, right, I'll see you later, I won't come in till Sunday. Like, it's not something like, yeah, we, you know, we used to do what he did, but like, he knows what cocaine does to a person. Yeah. But it's not that, it's like, everyone you say, why well, I just take cocaine? Because it makes me feel not normal. Like the part of my brain that's missing, like that's what you get off coke, you get that high. But then you are, you get a come down off cocaine anyway, and it makes you depressed. So on top of my bipolar, then I'll spend two days in bed crying, like feeling sorry for myself. I'm not well, I'm not well, but it's not that, it's the coke. Cause you, you know, I'm going out, but I'm not slipping my meds in my bag. So I'm going two days without my meds anyway. So how long did that take you to sort your head out? It, it can't have been a long time because obviously now you've got a... The day I found out I was pregnant with my son. And that was it, bam. Yeah, I was actually drinking when I found out I was pregnant with my son. Yeah. Me and Marvin had separated for a bit. One, you know, both had our own shit going on. His personal shit, my personal, you know. It was just, we was pushing each other away, me more than most, and I just got, I couldn't handle it. Like, they'll know why when it comes to Marvin's family when his story comes out. And then I found out I was pregnant with my son. But when my dad was dying, we bought him a dictaphone and, you know, make messages. And about three weeks after his funeral, we found the tape and we played it. And they did a part for me and my little brother. Yeah. And he went, miss her. Well, if you listen to this, I'm obviously gone. And then he goes, when I get to heaven, I'm going to send you a baby. And then when I found out I was pregnant with my son, I knew he was a boy. I knew he was a boy. I went out and started buying boys clothes. I knew he was a boy. But then in the back of my mind, I'm feeling guilty for being pregnant. Because it's that old saying, where there's a death, there's a birth. So did my dad have to die for my son to be born? Did my dad put me first before him? So it's so, you know, confusing, especially when you've got bipolar and then, you know, I'm used to running to the bottle every time I've got a problem or, you know, to my sniff dealer. And I couldn't. I couldn't do it. Kids are the best thing, aren't they? To yeah, focus. it's the best thing. I went through nine months of saying every single day that kid won't love me. He won't love me. Social services got involved when he was six, when I was six months pregnant because of my bipolar. He used to drug test me, drug test my half. He had to jump through hoops from, like, obviously the police have been called to my house from, you know, me fighting yeah. with Marvin, me getting drunk, me phoning the police on Marvin just because I'm drunk. 
and we had to go for meetings every day and then you've got police, you've got the board man and they've got my child's future in their hands. Now I wasn't under a court order to work with them, but if you don't work with them, see they tell you you're not under a court yeah, order. Yeah, yeah, of course. They got um, you in a catch up. But yeah, I did. I jumped through every hoop. Like they cut locks of my hair off. They knew there'd be drugs the in my system yeah. because I'd already took hair follicle. That goes back months and months and months. So when I'm only six months pregnant, I found out when I was like seven weeks. You know there's going to be drugs in my system anyway. You're just seeing if I'm going to kick off. And then, as you said, tell him, don't do things by half. You come by emergency C-section. Yeah. <clears throat> on bonfire night. And when he was 12 weeks old, social services signed him off. Said we have absolutely no fears. When they called him a ch child in need. And how and old I'm, is he? Tell him, he's going to be two on bonfire night. Two years now? Yeah. Happy years? Happy years. Crazy, tiring, like sleep deprivation on top of bipolar is dangerous. That's why I got psychosis. Best two years of my life. That kid's changed me. Never touched cocaine since. C can we finish on that note? Because I don't yeah. think I can take any more. <laughs> <laughs> Kira, I, I, I'm not even going to say out, guys. 